Well, welcome everybody to the Australian Institute of International Affairs Queensland branch, uh, our first uh, webinar of the year uh, in this COVID environment. Uh, we're delighted to see you back again. My name is Paul Lucas. Uh, I'm here with our special guest today, Professor Andrew Scott, and I'll say a little bit about him very, very shortly. Um, our topic today is the Nordic Edge, what can Australia learn from Nordic countries? And it's a bit of a discussion in, in an interview with uh, Andrew about the book that he edited and indeed wrote chapters in uh, on Scandinavian countries, Nordic countries, and what Australia might learn uh, from their experiences. So uh, Fiona Stanley says, encourage your local MP to read it. So uh, I'm a former MP and I've read a fair bit of it, but certainly a great read. Uh, can I acknowledge uh, that we are... In our instance here, meeting on the lands of uh, the, uh, the Turrbal and the Yagara people uh, and uh, pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging, uh, sovereignty never ceded uh, from them. Uh, our uh, first speaker uh, today or uh, tonight is uh, Professor Andrew Scott from Deakin University, their Professor of Politics uh, and uh, duly recognised in Australia as a leader in Nordic uh, uh, labour relations, politics and government matters and a very significant academic in labour market matters uh, generally uh, in, in Australia. Uh, one of the things that is really important, I think, about um, uh, Australia as fortunate a country as we are in world terms is also to under, always to understand that we can do better and there are many lessons to learn from other parts of the world. I think that's why this book is so important. Uh, so uh, I'll uh, now throw over to you, Andrew, to tell us a little bit about the book, and then we might actually discuss some of the themes uh, in, the, in the publication. Over to you, Andrew. Thanks very much, Paul. Great to be here and the uh, Institute. Uh, book, The Nordic Edge, the collection of chapters on what Australia can learn from Nordic countries, Sweden, Finland, Denmark, and Iceland and Norway uh, about many different issues, including employment policy, paid parental leave, resource taxation, gender budgeting, feminist foreign policy, prisoner rehabilitation, and other issues. It's the second book I've been involved with of this kind, seven years ago, I wrote another book called Northern Lights, which uh, was my initial output of research on the Nordic countries and their lessons for Australia, which happily led to. The Australian State Forming at Nordic Policy Centre, which has uh, led to its current collection, which has many contributors from the Australian Institute. Um, thanks, Andrew. Now, um, one of the things that is very popular in Australia, or perhaps a misconception or not, is Australians see the Nordic countries as high tax. They certainly see them as high uh, social welfare spend, but they see that high tax framework as therefore resulting in less of an opportunity for the private sector to invest or people on the, in the traditional wages and salaries uh, field to um, uh, achieve what they might otherwise achieve, achieve due to high taxing uh, in relation to government. Is that true or not? Is there a GDP trade-off or is there a, a, an individual wealth trade-off that you've noticed in relation to this uh, to the higher taxation and services level of these countries? It's a claim that's often made in Australian political debates that higher taxes are inherently a weak point on the economy and, and a disincentive for individual aspiration. But it's not a claim that's supported by evidence. And one of our significant early chapters is looking at 188 countries, including, of course, Australia and the Nordic countries, five of them. Uh, and the empirical evidence does not support propositions that higher taxes have a negative effect on GDP. Uh, in fact, there's a slight uh, positive indication of higher taxes uh, and prosperity, and an even stronger uh, positive association between high taxes and well-being when adjusted for inequality, and well-being or happiness is increasingly uh, a robust uh, thing that can be measured economically. It's not just a, a feel-good concept. Uh, there's, a, there's a strong literature on it. So high taxes, of course, can be controversial uh, in Australia, but if they are connected to good services, if the money is spent well, and for example, Medicare like living, is it is the most popular tax in Australia? Because people associate with you know going to doctor and being able to do so affordably. Yes, and I suppose like if you've just higher taxes, of course, 
uh, someone would say, well, look, you might as well just increase the tax forever. And it, it's about your point where it is spent. And uh, in particular, hypothecated taxes like Medicare levels. Do they have hypothecated taxes in the Nordic countries as well? This is a tax that goes specifically to this service or, or not as much? <clears throat> well, you can trace, and we've done it in, in fact, one of our, our very first reports on the Nordic Policy Centre. You can trace clearly um, taxes and the services they're linked with in the Nordic countries. They may not specifically call it a return tax or social security, they do have a social security contribution or a paid parental leave tax, but there are clear links there. And people have seen these taxes and they've grown over time. It's been over years and decades that taxes have been uh, raised in the Nordic countries for the provision of particular services like extensive paid parental leave, like still for training if you need it, gain the employment, and like a decent unemployment payment if you are out of a job. Well, I wonder if that fact would lead to more popular support in Australia if when you know, I think there's a very broad support for increased parental leave uh, payments in Australia. But if when, a, when that happened, that there was a tax that ma matched that particular initiative, so people saw that government wasn't just taxing for the sake of it, but applying it in a particular field? I think there would be more support, definitely, because, you know, there is concern. People, when you're in a relatively low tax country, Australia is, um, People feel that um, they're not getting any services, so they become reluctant to pay more taxes unless they can see evidence or they're, they're sure that the money will be well spent. So the NDIS uh, introduction, of course, was a hypothecation type approach. And I have no problem with the paid parental leave. Um, uh, if you send it six months of replacement by us, having an, a specifically earmarked tax for it. We may find an employer to make some contribution to that to this taxation of individual wage salaries. So um, one of the areas of concern that we've seen a lot of, um, particularly in the private sector wage outcomes in Australia, uh, in the past it was an item of pride uh, for Australia that many other countries of the world, the share of GDP that went to um, um, uh, profit increased and that to labour decreased, and Australia never had that problem. We kept uh, Labor getting its fair share of the growth in the economic pie. Last twenty or so years, um, we've seen uh, uh, you know we've seen that decline. I think you talk about that uh, particularly um, in your um, uh, uh, in uh, one of the chapters there. Um, I'm just trying to find it. Um, uh, workers' wages in Australia hardly increased, growing at levels similar to inflation during 2014 the onset of the coronavirus crisis in early 2020, um, and similarly between 2000 and 2019, Australian wages certainly didn't keep up the Scandinavian countries. So none of the productivity gains that happened in that time accrued to LABAUR. Uh, I think that's a great shame that Australia has actually joined the United States and other countries where they use Peter Garrett's uh, terminology, the rich get richer, the poor get the picture. Um, can you comment on that uh, in terms of why has um, has that productivity still been shared with LABAUR um, in uh, Scandinavian countries? Well, the key reason, Paul, is that uh, strong trade unions have kept industry-wide collective wage bargaining going. Sectoral bargaining, uh, not at the level of individual enterprise, and that has enabled better wage outcomes. That was a huge problem with stagnation of wages in Australia and enterprise bargaining is centrally implicated in this. Uh, and the Nordic approach has led to more equality and fairer share. And it's one that employers are investing in as well because they have a good relationship uh, with you. They don't always agree with us, but they do really cooperate significantly in in determining wage setting uh, in various industries in advance, several years in advance, and also looking at skills training. So one, one of the odd uh, really interesting parts of the book uh, was uh, the discussion on feminist foreign policy. And obviously, uh, uh, AIA is an organisation that is formed with an interest in foreign policy. And uh, you have a chapter that's actually written by uh, former Swedish Foreign Minister Margot Wallström, and in her chapter, she writes about the three R's to feminist foreign policy. So I might just refer to those because I thought they were very interesting um, and uh, uh, 
that, uh, and, I, and I ask you to comment on that. So I'm just quoting um, uh, former Minister Volstrom. We designed a model with three R's that became a guide in all the work we did in the world. Uh, uh, the first R is rights, um, and she indicates the Swedish word for it. Do women and girls enjoy the same legal rights as men and boys? Do women have inheritance rights? Can a woman open a bank account or start a business? Are there child marriages? Can girls go to school? Are women legally allowed to drive a car? Are human rights also women's rights? Is there discrimination against women? The second R is also represent, is representation. Are women represented in governments and parliaments? Are they there at the tables where important decisions are discussed and decided? Are they on the boards of companies? Uh, are they also female judges in the judicial system? Both on my own, which had a contemporary debate in Australia. The third R is resources. Are resources being allocated to promote equal opportunities for all women and girls to enjoy human rights? So this is the context of a Swedish foreign policy. Can you let us know a little bit more about uh, uh, how they sought to put that into practice in their extension uh, of soft power um, throughout the world? Well, it's very much an initiative. Feminist foreign policy was made spearheaded by Margaret Bostrom at a time as Swedish foreign minister from 2014 to 2019. And she emphasised those points with the Swedish representation on the UN Security Council. And clearly, as you mentioned, the representation of resources is question about issues that are relevant to Australia too. The first set of issues you mentioned, rights, it is, of course, shocking to think about it. You know, the idea of countries where there are child Americans where girls are not allowed to go to school, not allowed to live in the tribal town. And that is a reality in a number of countries in the world. And we in Australia don't have a feminist foreign policy. So putting a scrutiny of countries which have such situations, um, not being allowed, women not being allowed to drive a car or open a bank account, uh, and taking that into account in determining foreign policy positions is a very significant thing to do. And that's what Margaret Volstrom has done in Sweden's bilateral relations and in the UN, and other countries have followed, including France and several others. And I think Australia should seriously consider doing likewise. On the question of child marriage, one of the shocking statistical facts that Margaret points out, which I was unaware of until we, we made contact with the interviews that led to her chapter, one in every five girls in the world under the age of 18 is married today. And that's a, that is a shocking fact because it, if you're married under the age of 18, you're not going to have a decent life. You're not going to have opportunities. And Margot's leadership and Sweden's leadership of the feminist foreign policy is designed to tackle those sorts of injustices, not sweep them aside, but put them in the centre of foreign policy so they can be charged. And I think it's better. It's what is second nature, at least in Australia now, that, you know, of course, uh, equal access to education it would be an aspiration of every Australian family, for, regardless of the gender of their children, um, it is not the case in many parts of the world. And, and I just wanted to develop that point. But to ask you, not so much now in relation to Swedish foreign policy, but Scandinavian domestic policy, yes. um, because we know that the big single best indicator of the health and wealth of a society in the world is the status of women and girls. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, issues such as education, employment, access to health, fertility control, parliamentary representation, and Australia has made significant strides there. But is there more that we need to do domestically that we can learn from the Scandinavian countries? Uh, I always would have thought that you know, the argument in this field, there are two arguments. First of all, it is morally correct and the right thing to do to treat everyone in society uh, uh, equally uh, and therefore not to do that for women and girls is morally wrong. But secondly, it is economically dumb uh, not to allow full participation in society by all of your um, uh, society. And we see, you know, what is happening in Taliban-controlled Afghanistan now, um, how besides the fact that it's terribly wrong and morally wrong, um, it's economically devastating mm. to do it. So uh, what can we learn? What do we need to do better uh, in Australia uh, on the basis of the Scandinavian uh, war Nordic prescription? 
Well, uh, quite a lot. And Margot's uh, pursuit of a feminist foreign policy is very much linked to her experience of Sweden's global leadership in domestic uh, gender equality, which is she's seen over her lifetime. She talks about the personal experience of improvement in the role of fathers, for example, in their, in their children's lives. Paid parental leave in Sweden 16 months for a family, of which a minimum of three months must be taken by the father. So can we just emphasise that again? Because I found it really interesting. Blokes just can't get off the hook by saying it's going to be my partner, my female partner, who's going to look after the kid and take the leave. Dads have to take leave themselves. They have to take a minimum of three months. Yeah. Otherwise, the family doesn't get more than three months. Right. So that's a strong incentive for fathers to do it. And it's paid at a replacement wage. And 16 months, of course, sounds like a long time. and uh, uh, But it's a crucial time. It's the time when parents born with their children, those crucial uh, first 16 months of a child's life. And if you give the parents support with leave then, then that sets them and their children up well for the future. And the, the most interesting thing I think about is that Sweden, by giving the longest paid parental leave in the world, has pretty much the highest female workforce participation rate in the world. And, and the proportion of women in full-time jobs in Sweden is 20 percentage points higher than Australia. So the idea that if you give more paid parental leave, women won't return to the workforce, the exact opposite is true. If you give more paid parental leave and you have affordable quality early child education care, which is a huge feature for Nordic countries, then women will return to the workforce more. You will get higher participation. Of course, the, the, that helps the economy. It helps revenue to fund such programs. And look, I, I, is there any, and I think we've learned this, uh, you know, ironically, from COVID, uh, that we can be far more flexible with workplace arrangements, working from home, et cetera. Is there anything that we can, um, uh, that the uh, Nordic countries have done in terms of flexible workplaces, uh, work from home, uh, and the like? Often the greatest challenge to that, of course, besides employer flexibility, but they've had to have that with COVID, is technology, the internet, the like, the nature of housing. Can you comment on that? Is there anything that's there for us to learn or we'll, we'll look at? It. Yes, I think that comes back to industrial relations a bit because you know, keeping boundaries around work time, um, like you know, we all remember, you and I are old enough to remember the Australia, the weekend and the, the idea of a 40-hour week or 38-hour week. And the way that's been eroded so much by um, industrial relations change, and technology is part of that story, but you know, because the technology is there doesn't mean you have to work on your weekend. Uh, you can have a right to switch off. You can uh, you know, have uh, email-free weekends and so on. And there is a much stricter protection of standard working hours in the Nordic countries. And I think Australians um, would welcome similar policies. Um, from my experience, um, really the, you know, the poorest people in society um, as a group, besides First Nations, um, peoples, uh, single parents with kids, um, uh, they are, you know, more expensive to raise a child than just about anything else. Uh, they don't have established assets and the like. They often are on uh, lower incomes because they're younger in their life. Our, our welfare system in Australia doesn't always support them uh, the best and the way that they would be. Are there any differences in how Scandinavian countries look at that factor and uh, and how they support families uh, and children uh, and uh, particularly those who are not as wealthy as others in uh, in that early childhood uh, phase? Well, that's the great beauty of universalism and welfare. Um, we have in Australia a targeted welfare system and it's a very narrowly targeted one now. It actually works well to the extent that that it operates, but it doesn't, it's arguably too targeted and not universal enough. Medicare is universal, the age pension is pretty much universal, if you tests on it, and so on. But a universal a welfare system lifts up everybody, and everybody has a stake in it. That, of course, contributes to their willingness to pay taxes because they know they're getting these benefits. They know that if they lose their job, they'll get retrained, they'll get an unemployment payment in Denmark, which is 90% of replacement wage, not less than 40% in Australia. So um, paid parental leave and public-oriented quality early 
childhood education and care, which is affordable, it starts early. It starts not long after the pay premium finishes. You can be in uh, early childhood education and care as a one-year-old, and a two-year-old, and a three-year-old, and that's not unusual in Nordic countries. The fact that everyone has that opportunity means that those who are poorer, those who are single mothers, uh, uh, are lifted up. They're not. They're not left behind. And so that's 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 I think the big message from the Nordic countries. Uh, of course, you mentioned with respect to um, um, uh, higher levels of support in relation to unemployment. Of course, you did also note, though, that there is um, earlier that you pay unemployment insurance, which is something that you don't do in, in Australia. So, I mean, there is a taxation requirement to... Uh, what happens if you're never in the workforce, um, uh, you know, and people are, you know, for reasons, you know, frequently beyond their control, ill health, injury, whatever... Um, how, do, how are they supported? Well, they are supported with disability pensions uh, and, and measures of that kind. Yes, they wouldn't have to contribute to unemployment insurance fund if they've never worked. Uh, unemployment insurance is, is something that involves trade unions, it involves governments and employers as well. This is the tripartism, uh, social corporatism. It's the kind of thing that, uh, of course, was discussed much in Australia in the 1980s during the Accord period into the 90s, we had a partial social corporatism. Uh, we talked about the social wage law in those days, um, and the social wage includes things that governments provide. Brian Howe is a social security minister talked a lot about uh, family allowance supplements and so on, and that, that was one of the achievements of that year. But it's done on a much grander scale and it has endured more substantially in the Nordic countries. Yeah, I certainly remember as a child, this was before family allowance supplements, my mother would used to collect the child endowment from the Commonwealth Bank and she used to mention how little it was. It was only a few dollars a week. And it wasn't until family allowance supplement, for example, started to realise that, you know, working families or families supporting young children are the ones who really do, do, do it tough. Um, the, uh, one of the things that Australia is noted for throughout the world and as they say, the greatest the great Australian dream is home ownership. Um, but rates have been dramatically falling in relation to home ownership, and we've seen prices, in particularly in the capital cities, go through the roof, um, putting great pressure um, on housing affordability for younger people, in particular, to enter the market. Um, what is the Nordic housing prescription? Um, how do they house people? Is private ownership um, significant there? Um, it is seen by, well, and not only seen by, it is uh, the major asset that most people accumulate during their lives in this country and are, are very much alive both. Tell us about the Nordic um, uh, way in those matters are dealt with. Well, essentially, Nordic countries, like most continental European countries, and to an extent Britain too, don't have the same universal uh, expectation of home, home ownership that many Australians have had because they just don't have the physical space. They don't have the big uh, areas for continuing urban suburban sprawl that we see in, in Australian cities. Uh, and therefore, medium density uh, living and a, 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 a big chunk of people living as renters is not unusual. And nor is it stigmatised. I mean, Australia, because home ownership is given such a uh, precious fetish, almost like status. If you don't own a home, if you're a renter, it, it's seen as you stigmatise and you don't have enough rights. So stronger protections, regulation and support for renting as a valid option, that's an important part of the water approach. Now, given that Australia, given what's happening in Australia, as the prices keep going up and it's clear that the generation of young people uh, uh, may not be able to own their own homes, we have to look at countries that have long had a better balance between ownership and other housing security options that involve rent, that involve public housing, social housing, and cooperatives. 40% of housing in the capital city of Norway, Oslo, is cooperatives. So we can get away from uh, individual private home ownership and do it quite successfully. And the Nordic countries show its ways to do that. Yes, but that's surely that's, you know, uh, uh, and housing cooperatives are an important thing, but that's to an extent, letting government off the hook, isn't it? That, that um, uh, you know, the one thing in my previous career uh, as a Member of Parliament that struck me as absolutely an entitlement throughout society is the ability to accumulate modest assets and then leave them in your family. Uh, uh, you know, inheritances are accumulating, accumulating wealth 
and we'll talk about national superannuation in a minute, are not the preserve of wealthy people only. So, you know, um, I, I, I'm wondering, whilst certainly housing cooperatives and the like are a method of, of dealing with affordability issues, uh, one wonders in our context and in our social uh, uh, milieu in Australia, I wonder whether that would be, uh, you know, well I, well, I put it to you that that's not the be all and end all, uh, uh, you know, in that regard. No, I accept that. I accept, and, and indeed, the book doesn't cover much on housing, and, and uh, the book has been described as a small bit more. Small bit more is a Swedish word, of course, but if you say it, you have to spell it the Swedish way with the dots and the circles above, certain vowels right. therein. Um, and th this is perhaps a missing ingredient. And we're going to do a report on housing for more you know, tackling up some taking up some of these issues. I think you're right, but I think uh, it comes back to the fact that Australia can't pretend much longer that home ownership is a time for everyone. And therefore, we need to think about what uh, other approaches we can take. And in doing so, we can look at other countries where home ownership uh, has never been quite as fetishised or seen as uh, universally attainable as Australia because there's environmental and financial limits on what we can do, keep doing in Australia on the current path. Um, let's get on to national super, superannuation. I, um, despite the fact of what certain people at the Grattan Institute might, might view from their privilege in a city um, background, uh, national superannuation is. Um, seen as an item of faith now in Australia. I think it is becoming entrenched like uh, Medicare is, uh, like that, the NHS is in Britain. Um, but the national super, superannuation is not without its issues yet. Uh, it is too low in terms of a retirement income for most people. In particular, we've seen um, women, uh, middle-aged and older women who are the subject of a... Um, relationship breakdown or who are primary caregivers and therefore are out of the workforce and not able to contribute to superannuation, uh, not have the level of superannuation balances and therefore not have the retirement that, you know, they, that they could and ought to expect. What is the Scandinavian uh, retirement incomes uh, regime? Is it uh, more a state-based system or is there the ability, uh, you know, employers contribute to the the vast majority of national super, albeit on a originally on an accord wages deal. Uh, a, a deal. Yeah, well, the Nordic approach um, is a more universal pension approach, and there's a stronger provision of government support. Employers do contribute this various social security contribution taxes and so on. Australia's taken a very distinctive course, and I think I agree that industry superannuation is a big achievement. In Australia. Um, you know, the, the extension of superannuation beyond the privileged few that's happened in the last few decades is extremely significant and it has many positive features, but it does have some limitations too because your superannuation balance, your retirement income at the end, will reflect, is based, is totally linked to how many years you spent in full-time paid employment. And that means it's a lot less for women. And that goes back to that question of women's workforce participation. Now, of course, if, you, if we got women's workforce participation up at 20 percentage points to Swedish levels, then the problems of poverty uh, for middle aged and retired women would be fewer. Um, but we do have to think about the gender inequities there. Industry super has many merits, including uh, the cooperation that occurs. One of the last places we cooperation is occurring significantly in Australia between employers and trade unions. So I think we need to work with the grain of industry super and, and uh, improve it. Um, you, um, you speak about the, the significant, in the book, the significant Nordic support for workers during COVID. Australia, we had jobs, job keeper, um, and uh, it uh, had a number, whilst uh, the quick response was welcomed, uh, was at a significant level. It had a number of criticisms, one that including, whilst our welfare system is, is designed to very quickly claw back any overpayments, yeah. it had no overpayment clawback situation for very large companies that actually made more money out of COVID, uh, during COVID. Um, it, um, if, if you worked only a couple of hours a week, you got the minimum, which would for, was a windfall for some people. Uh, and, of course, uh, it didn't recognise continued, um, particularly in the hospitality industry, for example, continued difficulties that workers there faced after uh, it, it, it ran out. Uh, what 
was the, uh, uh, the, the Nordic COVID response or indeed uh, uh, in relation to uh, this, uh, if you could compare and contrast? Yeah, well, in terms of the wage subsidy, job seeker, sorry, job keeper, um, obviously, you know, to set up a massive wage subsidy in a very short space of time is going to be where you don't have a tradition of doing so. It's going to have a lot of problems, and it has had. And, and there's no reason why those overpayments shouldn't be caught. There's no reason why the government shouldn't be going after those um, who have not been entitled to, to things. The idea of a wage subsidy, however, is sound, and wage subsidies, subsidies are well established in the market countries, and therefore they're planned better, and they are better set up to, to increase wage subsidies for COVID because they have the tradition of doing so. They have participation... Uh, in terms of employers, cooperation with, with trade unions and the government, tripartism. Now, um, wage subsidies have existed in Australia before, in, including, for example, the Working Nation programs, uh, the early 1990s, early to mid-1990s, following a recession, labour market programs, things like traineeships, wage subsidies, apprenticeships. They can be done well, but they have to be set up well, monitored, and uh, operated fairly and equitably. So uh, there's been a lot of blunders with JobKeeper, but wage subsidies, I think, can and should play a role in Australia's future, and Nordic precedents help show how to do it well. Um, during the, uh, and, and you refer in, in the book, and I think it was well known uh, to those of us who follow uh, what's happened around the world in COVID, um, Perhaps paradoxically, Sweden took a bit of a laissez-faire approach to dealing with COVID. Uh, you know what we would say in Australia: let it rip uh, in relation to infections very early, and they had very significant death rates, far higher than their neighbours. Albeit, as you point out, still more, still better. You know, less high uh, less high rates than, for example, the United States. Certainly, nowhere near as as, as uh, favourable outcomes as Australia and New Zealand. Um, did we out Nordic the Nordics um, in, in, in that field? Uh, that, that, that the role of the state uh, protecting society um, was, uh, you know, Australia was seen as pretty world leading there. What, what should be on there? I think, you know, there's some areas where Australia does do better than Nordics and New Zealand. And, and we've got to give credit when that happens. And this was one. I mean, we, I will say that Australia and New Zealand did have the advantage of being very remote from the original sources of contagion, but nevertheless, the emphasis on public health first and safety and lockdowns and strict health measures, uh, social distancing, all those things, correctly in my personal view, were better than, than Sweden. The other Nordic countries didn't take the same approach as Sweden. This, this was actually an interesting example where the Nordic countries operate a lot on trust, and generally that works well for them. This may have been an example, I think, in Sweden where they perhaps trust a little bit too much. Trust that people would always do the right thing. I do wonder if there might be something here in Australia's tradition of compulsory voting, um, which is very unusual, uh, that may have served as well. Um, but it, I think also the individual epidemiologist in charge of Sweden, uh, Sweden's COVID response happened to take a view that herd immunity might not be such a bad idea. And so they generally trust uh, in in people in that such positions. Maybe if it was a different individual in that position, it would have been a different outcome. The other Nordic countries, the other four, Denmark, Finland, Norway and Iceland, took a, a stricter approach and have done better, not only than uh, America, but better than Britain and better than Canada. Just as a quick aside, um, if, you know, to my thinking, you've got throughout the world, not obviously a generalisation, but we need to do that in these sorts of discussions, um, the United States, of course, founded on suspicion of the role of government and that permeates into the way that they they don't like being told to do things. Um, um, you've got uh, many uh, Eastern European countries, um, ex-totalitarian regimes, where there is simply no trust of government in terms of um, uh, its ability or willingness to look after people and therefore, uh, you know, uh, why cooperate, with, you know, with government. Uh, Australians notwithstanding our very heavy Irish, Irish influence, um, tend to be people who do accept government intervention and are prepared to you know, line up in queues and do as they're told, et cetera. Um, 
the Scandinavian countries have brought in like that as well? Is, it, is that a similar sort of attitude that they see governments predominantly motivated in the interests of society? I think, yeah, I, mean, we, I think that's actually one of the reasons that I'm doing this work. We are doing this work at the Australian Institute because we do think Australia has enough of a tradition of the role of government and of egalitarianism to do things uh, further in that respect in, 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 in keeping with and learning from the Nordic countries. There is something in that. I mean, certainly, yeah, there's a lot of literature about why Australia differs from Europe in this respect. The founding population uh, post-Indigenous uh, uh, 40,000, 60,000 years, of course, um, with the colonisation of Australia was more of a convict population issue rather than an individual aspiring religious uh, immigrant, as it was in America. Uh, it was a more working class competition. And, you know, there's arguments that the, these were foundational myths of the modern um, American and Australian nations, which are still important. And I think there is still a tradition of egalitarianism and, and a belief in some positive role of government in Australia, but we have to face up to the uh, the costs involved in achieving that, maintaining and, and uh, bringing back some egalitarianism. It is going to cost some more in tax payments and uh, fairness, and particularly from those at the higher end. I mean, I think Gina Reinhart would be chipping in a bit more in terms of uh, resource wealth taxation a la, um, is required in Norway, and that would make a big difference to our ability to fund things. I a, one of the interesting things I, when I'm doing my international work, it's I, I always enjoy telling people that uh, Australia has, uh, I think, the highest proportion of overseas-born uh, citizens um, uh, in the OECD. But uh, I, I think on what you say in the book, though, that uh, we're lo much lower these days in refugees than the Scandinavian countries, but, you know, I think now it's about 28% of Australians are born overseas and over 50% of Australians have one parent born overseas. So we are indeed one of the most multicultural nations on earth. Uh, and I think we are, in international terms, extremely tolerant. And can I put this to you? Um, uh, as I said, you mentioned the proportion of refugees uh, that, that are accepted by Scandinavian countries. And uh, certainly the book notes attitudes, for example, uh, in Denmark uh, to refugees and migrants has been very positive. Uh, yet in 2017, uh, Denmark joined a number of other European countries, including France and Belgium, in banning uh, face coverings in public. Um, how do Nordic countries um, resolve the intersection between social norms, the rights and status of women, for example, uh, and uh, individual cultural um, uh, and uh, norms or indeed uh, manage to be welcoming to migrants and their different views of the world, um, you know, either on uh, uh, ethnic or indeed religious grounds. How do they um, uh, resolve those issues, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 and uh, to give you an example, in certain cultures, um, uh, uh, genital mutilation is legal uh, in some parts of Africa. It is, is of course, um, absolutely uh, illegal in Australia. And, uh, you know, your right to uh, uh, express your religious practices are prohibited on that basis for doing that. How do uh, we resolve that? In, how do they resolve that in Scandinavian countries, for example? Well... I think what, what we're seeing here is that in Australia has that very high level of immigration multiculturalism and a long history now, uh, particularly since the Second World War, of culturally diverse um, immigration and can be proud of that. Now, Sweden particularly has become, of the Nordic countries, has become much more multicultural in the last 20 years. It has done so in large measure through accepting a much higher proportion of refugees from places like Syria. Australia has, for example. Um, and there are tensions in Nordic countries around that. In Denmark, you've raised the issue of face coverings and mentioned France. And in France, of course, the issue there is to do with secularism and the, the legacy of the French Revolution or the idea of laïcité in France, which not only uh, 
requires Muslims not to wear certain things, but requires Christians not to wear certain things in public schools, for example, like crucifixes. And, and, and for example, in France, you must get married in a state ceremony. You can go off and have a church ceremony if you like, but you always have to get married in a state ceremony. Exactly. And so there they you find some interesting differences. And Australia has evolved with multiculturalism and, yeah, very proudly so. Although on refugees, we've gone back. I mean, it's, we accept immigrants, we love them, but they can't, if they get on a boat without authorisation, they can never, ever come here. But many people who got on a boat uh, in the past could come here and did come here and did very well. They made a great contribution. One of the people who uh, John Howard's uh, troops uh, refused entry to who was saved by the Norwegian ship Tampa back in 2001, um, 20 years, just over 20 years ago, recently uh, came to Australia for the first time as a Fulbright scholar. He was taken by New Zealand. So we lost that person, for example. He was a kid on, on board the, the ship uh, that was rescued by the Tampa. We, so we, we must be aware of our weaknesses as well as our strengths, but I think, you know, the Nordic countries have a way to go to to completely reconcile their achievements with social democratic egalitarianism in a more multicultural world. Sweden is showing away there, but it has challenges. And in some respects, it can learn from Australia. Uh, interestingly, the book makes the point, of course, that uh, the, 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 the tradition of democracy and the ability of everyone to participate in, it in the Nordic countries is certainly not something that is established over a lengthy period of time it was something more, I think, in the early 1900s that, you know, that, 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 that became established. Yeah, that's right. I mean, uh, Sweden, uh, I mean, we, you know, another thing that Australia, of course, led the world on um, was the secret ballot and uh, the franchise. And uh, Nordic countries, Thomas Piketty, like that, the, Thomas Piketty, the very prominent French uh, person who's put inequality back in the international debate, Sweden went from being a very poor and unequal country to being the most quintessentially social democratic equal country in the world rather quickly in the, from the, you know, about the 1930s mark of the 20th century. And it was done through political change. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't, you know, in his view and in my view too, it wasn't because of some ancestral Viking Inheritance. It wasn't because Lutheranism is more predisposed towards social democracy. It's because very effective social democratic labor type party leaders and trade unionists were highly successful and uh, fought for their principles and uh, implemented them in ways that led to great support. And they created a new common sense. The common sense in Sweden is very different from America. The common sense in Sweden is that nobody's safe unless everybody's safe. And you must look after your neighbour. In America, it's all about an individual can rise. Some individuals can rise into the stratosphere, um, and that that's so good that apparently it means it's okay to have a huge proportion of African American men in jail and so many people in poverty and so much violence. They're very different. Uh, the common senses, and uh, I think Australia would be more Nordic than American, and it's it's in between. Many indicators at the moment, and we're arguing it needs to go more Nordic, otherwise, it's going to become more American. Um, just in, in, in closing, um, uh, Andrew, uh, uh, you know, the book is very extensive in the, in, in the um, it's very readable, but it, you know, quite a number of areas that it covers. If there were two or three policy lessons that we could, that you could bullet point, you could highlight. Um, that you think Australia should consider adopting. Um, what are they and why? This is the uh, politician type question about priorities. And interestingly, we Chris Bowen asked me a very similar question in the webinar we did. And that's fair enough, of course. You know, it's, it's, it's easier to write a book about everything you want than, than it is to uh, make a choice about priorities. Well, I would say, personally, I would say uh, gender equality and investment in children is one. We talk about paid parental leave and so on. Uh, we perhaps could have said more uh, about environmental leadership, um, taking climate change seriously and tackling it. And they are the key things. And they are the things that can, can overcome inequality. So if you, if you put a gun to my head and said, which 
of the three policies would you most want to do? Personally, I would say extensive paid parental leave, quality affordable early childhood education and care, gender equality, including gender budgeting, and environmental policy relation. Now, I've done four of these. If you want to cut it back further, you know, we can do that in a private session. Well, look, we just better, because you've mentioned two important subjects, we better, uh, you know, with the exception, with, with hopefully not to stretch the friendship too much of uh, um, our, our time. Can you very quickly then highlight the gender budgeting yes. uh, and, and the environmental issues, just perhaps a book form? Absolutely. Well, gender budgeting actually was invented by Australia. Uh, and it flourished in the 1980s. Marion Saw, the co-author of our chapter on gender budgeting, with her Swedish collaborator, Lenita Friedenbaum, talks about this and how Australia then stopped doing it. It faded away, particularly faded away with Tony Evans' prime minister. Uh, but the Nordic countries kept it going. They, they thought it was a brilliant idea and they, they embedded it. So if you have gender budgeting, it means you can't make major policy decisions, including on things like taxation, without taking into account whether they disadvantage women and men, women or men, disproportionately. And that leads to very different policies. Um, and the environmental leadership of the Nordic countries is huge. Uh, it's, not, it's not a coincidence. The leading uh, spokesperson for the uh, movement against climate change in action is a Swedish teenager, Greta Thunberg. It's not a coincidence because this comes from a society that encourages young people uh, to care about their future and to have the right to speak up. On it. And Sweden, Finland, Denmark, Norway, and Iceland have very early on adopted carbon taxes in the early 90s. Germany went and did so in the late 90s. The environment is at the heart and, and concern for the environment is at the heart of their policies. So it's it's something we can learn from Australia. And it's also something that we can do in a way that's not uh, detrimental to jobs. There's a lot of renewable energy jobs to be created. The Gladstone Steel uh, announcement by the Queensland State Government is a recent one. Denmark's done a lot with wind power job creation. Sweden's doing a lot with renewable energy to create steel manufacturing jobs. Well, um, what a really interesting session and uh, great to talk to you, Andrew, about the book. Uh, and here it is again. Uh, now, I got my copy at Dimex. Uh, $32.99, so uh, certainly not expensive, uh, and an, an, uh, an eminently readable book uh, as well. Where else, uh, Andrew, uh, if someone wants to get online or the like, where else can they find it? Uh, the best place online is if you go to the Melbourne University publishing website, they're our publisher. Um, you can go to, if you're uh, in Brisbane, you can go to Dimex. If you're in Melbourne, you go to Reeves. Dimex is all over Australia, of course. It's in many bookshops. I'm glad you said it was readable because and well-priced because some academic books are described as not being so readable and well-priced, apparently. Uh, I, I see that it's very important for academics to be communicating to uh, a very wide audience and uh, our fellow citizens because, in the end, uh, politics is about trying to achieve change and hopefully change for the better. Well, thanks very much, uh, Andrew, and uh, thank you, everybody, for uh, listening in this evening. It's been a great pleasure. Uh, to have Professor Andrew Scott uh, speaking oh, from Deakin University, Professor of Politics, uh, speaking about uh, the Nordic Edge, uh, his book, and a number of the issues that have been raised. Thanks very much. Thank you, Paul.